Hello and a very good morning. You're watching the breakfast news on Rajya Sabha Television. I'm your host Frank Pereira. Here are the latest headlines. Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaches Fiji on the last leg of his three-nation tour. He's addressed the Fijian Parliament and announced a 70 US, 70 million US dollar line of credit to the island nation. Sharad Pawar sets the cat among the pigeons. Once again, asks NCP cadres to get ready for snap polls in Maharashtra. Centre seeks report from Haryana government on clashes between police and flowers of Rampal during police action at his ashram in Hisar, over 100 reportedly injured. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe calls for snap elections after the country slips into economic depression, agrees to postpone an unpopular sales tax hike. And NATO raises fresh concern on serious troop buildup on both sides of the Ukrainian border. Russia seeks NATO pledge on Ukraine. First up in the bulletin this morning, Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived in Fiji early this morning on the last leg of his three-nation tour. He addressed the Fijian parliament a short while back, announcing a 70 million US dollar line of credit to Fiji for a co-generation power plant. He also announced a visa on arrival for Fijians when they come to India. He spoke of efforts to make trade and travel between the two countries easier and working with Fiji against climate change and on digital advancement. Modi is also to hold bilateral talks with his uh, counterpart Frank uh, Bani Marama and uh, meet leaders and representatives of 12 Pacific Island nations before he departs for India. Thank him for his support on India's new assistance projects in Fiji. These include a parliament library, a fund of 5 million US dollars to promote small business and village enterprise in Fiji. Well, earlier, Prime Minister Modi wrapped up his five-day visit to Australia with a flourish. After addressing the country's parliament in Canberra, he jet-setted to Melbourne to unveil the 2015 Cricket World Cup trophy and spoke to business folk just before leaving. All in all, a power-packed finish. Here's a detailed report. My friend, Tony Abbott, congratulations to you and the people of Australia on a successful G20. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's date with the Australian Parliament coming a day after the Chinese President delivered his address to then and MPs. The third head of the government, you are listening to this. Modi speech. used it to have dig at China about its many disputes over the South China Sea. Our region has seen huge progress on the foundation of peace and stability. But we cannot take this for granted. They have bitter disputes. We should collaborate more on maintaining maritime security. Despite Australia emerging as a key source of thermal coal for India, Modi insisted that India is looking for an early closure on the uranium sale deal. Energy that does not cause our glaciers to melt. Clean coal and gas, renewable energy are fuel for nuclear power. Prime Minister Modi also made a trip to the cricket ground for a photo op with cricketing greats and wishing the Australian team ahead of the Cricket World Cup next year. I wish you the best for hosting great and successful ball cricket early next year. Both Modi and Abbott also said they will push for a free trade pact. This was after Australia on Monday finalized a landmark free trade deal with China that significantly expanded ties between the world's second largest economy. We want to go further and that's why the next priority for Australia is a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with India. Both sides signed five agreements on social security, transfer of sentenced prisoners, combating narcotics trade, tourism and arts and culture. 
We also agreed on seeking early closure on the civil nuclear agreement, which will give Australia a chance to participate in one of the most secure and safe nuclear energy program in the world. The Prime Minister also met business leaders in Melbourne, taking the opportunity to promote his Make in India initiative. Modi said the focus is on promoting labour-intensive manufacturing. He also stressed upon the initiatives and reforms undertaken by his government to enhance the ease of doing business in India. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Moving on to politics back home now, just days after the trust vote in Maharashtra, the minority BJP government faces new trouble. The NCP that had agreed to support the government from outside is already flexing its muscles. NCP chief Sharad Pawar even said that he did not rule out snap polls soon. With no progress in talks between the BJP and the Shiv Sena yet, the state is looking at fresh political crisis. NCP has changed its stance on supporting the BJP in Maharashtra, putting the minority government in a spot. After offers of outside support and abstaining trust vote to help BJP, NCP has now taken a U-turn saying it is not the party's responsibility to ensure the state government's stability. NCP chief Sharad Pawar asked his party men to get ready for a snap poll. <laughs> The remarks come within a week of Chief Minister Devendra Fadnavis securing a controversial trust vote. The confidence motion was passed by a voice vote in complete chaos, triggering demands for a fresh trust vote. However, Fadnavis is not too worried over NCP's change in stance. While he remains hopeful about BJP's talks with Shiv Sena, Udhav Thakre said his party is happy playing opposition's role. Mid-term polls should not be like that. And that's why they won't be. Shiv Sena, we haven't closed the door for the talk to Shiv Sena. Until now, I haven't thought about any of the things. I'm going to see what happens. But until then, we have to give up to the leader of Shiv Sena. And we have to do our work. The talks between the two former allies had collapsed over Sena's reported demands for Deputy Chief Ministership and some key portfolios. Despite BJP's claims, no formal talks have reopened between two parties so far. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, the centre has asked the Haryana government for a report on clashes between the police and followers of cell style Godman Rampal in Hisar yesterday. There was high tension at uh, Barwala's Saplok Ashram when Rampal's followers and police clashed after police stormed the ashram to arrest the cell style Godman and remove his followers. Thousands of Rampal supporters uh, clashed with police and opened fire and uh, hurled crude bombs and stones at police. 100 people, including policemen, Rampal's followers and two media persons were injured. The police had been uh, camping at the Satlok Ashram for almost a week and took action yesterday after the High Court issued a fresh non-bailable warrant against Rampal. The Punjab and Haryana High Court has reserved judgment on cancellation of Rampal's bail. Two karmacharis <laughs> have been hit with a gun. वे हस्ताल में हैं। बाकी डिटेल मेरे पास लगातार अभी आए जा रहे हैं, ऑपरेशन जारी रहेगा और जब तक हम इसको अपराधी को पकड़ नहीं लेंगे, तब तक आश्रम जाएं। हम तो भक्ति में लगे रहते हैं और जैसे आप पुलिस वाले दिखते हैं उनको तो वैसे लट ले लेके खड़े कर देते हैं आप तो जिसमें ऊपर में अलग से इनके कमांडो बनाए हुए हैं आपको दो दिन से रोका जा रहा था आज तो हमने देखा कि हमको मरना है या मारना है हमको निकलना है हमको या नहीं रहना है हमको बाबा ज well, some nasty clashes there in Hisar yesterday remains to be seen what happens today. Moving on now, of course, in what appears to be India's first direct contact with Ebola, a 26-year-old Indian man returning from Liberia who claims he has been cured of Ebola is in quarantine at the Delhi airport. This man is carrying a certificate from the Liberian government stating that he was cured of Ebola. Though his blood samples tested, uh, or rather tested negative for Ebola in three different tests, Ministry officials confirmed that his semen samples, which were analysed on November 17, tested positive for the virus. 
Health Ministry officials say that this man is the first confirmed patient diagnosed with the virus to have landed in India. They added that he is to be kept in isolation till his body fluids test negative to rule out the remotest possibility. Well, let's now take a look at uh, some other news stories lined up for the day today in our special segment, The Day Ahead. Home Minister Rajnath Singh will begin his two-day visit to Jammu and Kashmir today. He will hold a series of election rallies in Kishtwar and uh, Doda regions. He is also scheduled to campaign for party candidates in Ladakh on Thursday. Several other party bigwigs, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi, are to campaign in the state over the next few days in the run-up to the first phase of assembly polls on the 25th. Today is the 97th birth anniversary of India's first woman Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Dignitaries will pay floral tributes to her at her samadhi, the Shakti Sthal. A function will also be held at the Central Hall of Parliament, which will be attended by members of Parliament as well as the President. Starting today, the week will be observed as the Komi Ekta or National Integration Week. The 63rd plenary session of the Northeastern Council and the first under the Narendra Modi government will be held in New Delhi today. Governors and chief ministers of all eight states in the Northeast region would attend the session to discuss important development activities taken up by the different central ministries and government organizations. The annual plan and the gross budgetary support of the Northeastern Council would also be discussed at the session. A special court hearing the 2G spectrum allocation case will pronounce its order today on CBI's plea to summon additional prosecution witnesses including Enforcement Directorate's Deputy Director Rajeshwar Singh. The order was deferred yesterday. Maharashtra Chief Minister Devendra Fadnavis, who also heads the state unit of the BJP, will launch the party's membership drive in Mumbai today. It will continue till March 31st next year and is aimed at reaching out to different sections of society. A workshop for party office bearers at state and district levels will also be organized in Mumbai today. Well, it's time for a short break now, but still to come. Deadly attack on a synagogue in Jerusalem raises fears of a dangerous escalation of violence in the city. That and much more. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Rajas about television news from Japan. Now an unexpected uh, contraction in the economy for the second quarter in a row has prompted Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to call for snap polls. Abe will soon dissolve the lower house and also postpone an unpopular sales tax hike. But he has promised to continue working on fiscal consolidation. Here's a detailed report. Recession is back in Japan for the fourth time since 2008, as the country released weak economic data and doubts over his policies emerged. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is seeking to renew his mandate. He has called for early elections two years ahead of schedule. Abe has also decided to delay the second 10% sales tax hike by 18 months. Abe said the delay would help guide the economy out of slump. But the Prime Minister pledged that Japan was by no means abandoning fiscal reforms. He said the sales tax hike needed to fund swelling social security costs and curb the country's massive public debt would be implemented without fail in April 2017. 15年間 Japan's unexpected fall into recession has hampered Abe's cause. But few expect his party, the Liberal Democrats, to lose their majority. The party currently holds two-thirds of the seats in the House. The election will be held within 40 days from the date the House is dissolved. Abe is hoping to cement his grip on power with these snap elections before his ratings slip further. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. 
While joining me for a chat this morning is uh, the Associate Pro uh, Professor at uh, the JNU, Shrabani Roy Choudhury. Choudhury. Very good morning, Shrabani, and thank you for joining me on the program this morning. Uh, let's talk about the situation in Japan now, of course. We've seen that, uh, you, you know, in spite of here, the liberal Democrats in Japan having a two-thirds majority in parliament, Shinzo Abe has decided to go ahead and, you know, dissolve the parliament and call for snap polls. You know, what has really prompted this? Um, you see, when a leader goes in for a snap poll, mm. you must realize that he had a mandate till 2016, yes. end 2016. While it would seem encouraging for him to continue and not go in for a poll, his opinion poll suggests that he's 50 percent down in his, um, um, uh, in his credibility with the people. So given the situation, if he continues to go ahead without any uh, poll right now, he might end up in a situation when his credibility further decreases and he might not have a mandate to continue mm. to do his reforms. Mm. Mm. So currently in this situation, anyone who was watching Japan and if one looks at the history that Japan has had, we, would, we were looking at a uh, poll in case there was a recession being yes. declared. Yes. And two-quarter failure is one parameter which says that the country is in recession. So snap poll was due. Isn't, isn't it uh, a little dangerous as far as uh, Shinzo Abe is concerned? Because right now, of course, the party is hoping to retain majority. They're expecting to do well again. But things could just turn out differently. Um, you see, if uh, Abe loses, then Abenomics goes into the mm. back burner mm. and you would have a new leadership with a new set of uh, policies being given. But Abe needs to win a majority simply because the structural reforms that he is looking at is not easy to do because it's not just one single arrow like monetary easing. It is rather going to be multiple set of arrows being put at various kind of places to get the country's reform in place. Mm. And if he gets this mandate in the same order that he got the previous mandate, he and his party will be reassured that the people are willing to take the pains of the reform, which is why reforms have been taking such a slow step in Japan because the reforms are going to be painful. Reforms are definitely going to shake the Abe government. And if he comes back with a mandate, and I'm presuming that this time the kind of manifesto he would give mm, up, mm. give out, probably would have a clear direction of what is the pains and aches that the economy needs to go yes. through to reach what it wants to reach. You know, uh, he has postponed an unpopular sales tax. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the sales tax in the Japanese media. You know, uh, do, do you think it's a move to try and coax the voters? Or the, I mean, the voter is not that, that dumb at the end of the day. They know that this is going to eventually happen. So how do you see this particular issue panning out? See, when he had to increase the sales tax in April after winning his election, he said that while the taxes are getting in increasing, he would push in inflation and move the country. Mm. So that would lead to what we say, you know, uh, the household would spend more, productivity will rise, yes. and price would rise. So that would be the combination that you would have. But unfortunately, it has failed. The first quarter jump in his thing was a huge on Abenomics, but it mm. was essentially said that it was consumer spending before the taxes were on. Right now, um, he is walking um, tightrope. Tight rope, yes. Definitely. He has to, therefore, when he pushes what was supposed to be an October 2015 sales tax mm. review mm. now to uh, 2017, he is essentially telling people that he would get the inflation going, he would get the wage rate uh, high. Mm. So he, it will eventually mean that when you pay your taxes, you're not going to feel the pinch in the pocket. Yes. So that is his, uh, probably the game plan. And I'm sure that he would be lo to looking at lots of physical tax spending, mm. like he's mm. looking at probably increasing subsidies for poor families, um, especially um, the ones, and increasing women um, at wor in workforce. In work so course, yes. these two combination, currently when he had a 50% um, credibility with mm. the people, women voters were encouragingly voting for him. And if yes. you have the poor also voting, so LDP's profile of voters moves from being the rich uh, people to the poor people. So that would be an interesting thing to watch out Indeed, for. Indeed, interesting thing to watch out for. Thank you so much, uh, Shabani Roy Chaudhary, for joining us on the program this morning and putting things into perspective for us. Moving on now, NATO Secret uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has uh, called on Russia to pull back troops from Ukraine as well as its side of the Ukrainian border. He says that by doing so, Russia would contribute uh, to a peaceful agreement. 
Stoltenberg said that he had information on a build-up inside Ukraine. He further added that NATO saw movement of troops, equipment, tanks, artillery and also of advanced air defense systems along the Ukrainian border, terming it a gross violation of the ceasefire agreement by Russia. Russia has vehemently rejected the claims, now seeking a guarantee that no one would think about Ukraine joining the NATO. Meanwhile, German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier, who met his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov in Moscow yesterday, has said that the ongoing Ukraine-Russia crisis does not offer much optimism and urgent work is needed to ensure implementation of the Minsk Accord. Optimismus in der gegenwärtigen Situation, sondern das, was zu tun ist, ist harte Arbeit, Überzeugungsarbeit in einer Situation, in der der angestoßene Prozess offenbar von selbst nicht funktioniert. Wir haben eine ähnliche Diskussion gestern unter den europäischen Außenministern geführt und äh, natürlich mit einem oberflächlichen Blick auf die Gesamtsituation. Let's now take a look at some other news and updates from around the globe in our segment War Wrap. Five Israelis were killed in a frenzied assault by two Palestinians who targeted worshippers at a Jerusalem synagogue, the latest in a series of deadly attacks that many fear is pushing the city to the edge of a dangerous escalation in violence. Four of the people killed were rabbis. The fifth victim was an Israeli policeman who succumbed to his injuries late on Tuesday night. This incident intensifies tensions between Arabs and Jews over a contested shrine holy to both communities. Iraqi officials say that their security forces have reached the Baiji oil refinery after driving out Islamic State fighters from the area. Iraq's largest refinery was besieged by the IS for five months. IS fighters had first laid siege to the Baiji refinery in June after taking control of the nearby town of Baiji in a lightning advance through northern Iraq. A small group of Hong Kong pro-democracy pro protesters broke into the city's legislature via a side door early on this morning as tensions in the Chinese-controlled city escalated following a period of calm. The flare-up came just hours after court bailiffs managed to clear part of the protest camp in the heart of the city that has been occupied by pro-democracy demonstrators for nearly two months. The UN has adopted a landmark resolution condemning uh, North Korea's rights abuses and laying the groundwork for putting the Pyongyang regime in the dock for crimes against humanity. A resolution asking the Security Council to refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court passed by a resounding vote of 111 to 19 with the 55 abstentions in the uh, General Assembly Human Rights Committee. Now, the non-binding measure will go to the full General Assembly for a vote next month. Here's a look now at the global stock markets. U.S. stocks closed higher on Tuesday, lifted by further gains in healthcare shares and hopes for a stronger global economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 40.07 points, or 0.23%, to close the day at 17,687. Standard & Poor's 500 gained 10.48 points or 0.51% to end the day at 2051, its biggest one-day move since November 5th. The Nasdaq Composite added 31.44 points or 0.67% to finish at 4,702. Gold prices recovered by 40 rupees or 0.45% to 26,800 per 10 grams on scattered buying by jewelers and retailers to meet ongoing wedding season demand and affirming global trend. Silver prices were sharply up by 644 rupees or 1.77% at 37,033 per kilogram in futures trading today as participants build fresh positions buoyed by firm global queues. Asian stocks opened high today, led by Japanese shares after the Prime Minister sought to redeem his economic program by calling a snap election and putting off a sales tax increase. Japan's Nikkei is up by 112.36 points or 0.65% to 17,456 at the start of today's trading.
Hong Kong's Hang Seng rose 90.30 points or 0.21% to 23,597 at the start of trading. Well, let's take a look now at some updates from the sports arena in our sports beat. Indian hockey chief uh, Terry Walsh, who was in talks with the Sports Authority of India to get a new improved contract, has quit. Walsh said that the meeting did not yield the desired result. Tuesday was the last day of Walsh's tenure as the coach of the senior team, but the Australian was optimistic that Sai will, would revert to him by the weekend, agreeing to his certain terms and conditions. Vishwanathan Anand drew once again with defending world champion Magnus Carlsen of Norway in Game 8 of the 2014 World Championship in Sochi on Tuesday. The Chess Titans agreed to a draw after a game that saw Carlsen on the offensive playing his pawns at a faster speed than Anand. At the end of this round, Carlsen leads the 12-round match with 4.5 points to Anand's 3.5 points. The match will resume on Thursday after a day's rest. Luis Garcia fired a stunning header in the second half to help Atletico de Kolkata end their four-match winless run by registering a 1-0 win over Northeast United FC in their return leg ISL fixture on Tuesday. Garcia struck in the 51st minute, beating the towering Spanish World Cup winner Jon Capdevila in the middle and uh, the win helped ATK to go three points clear of Chennai in FC in the lead position. Doha will host the 2019 Athletics World Championships, winning a secret IAAF vote on Tuesday after losing out to London three years ago. This time, the Qatari capital beat the American bid from Eugene and Barcelona. Doha's victory was another major sporting boost for Qatar that will host the FIFA World Cup in 2022. FIFA has lodged a criminal complaint over the possible misconduct of individuals in connection with the awarding of hosting rights for the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. Last Thursday, FIFA said that there were no grounds to reopen the controversial bidding process following uh, the long-awaited report compiled by the chairman of the investigatory chamber of FIFA's Ethics Committee. Well, that's it on today's edition of The Breakfast News. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good day.